I never really believed in impossible. It's only impossible until somebody actually does it. And I've done plenty of things that people said was going to be impossible for me. So I don't approach things thinking that something is impossible or so outrageous. I just don't do that. What I do is I, I, I try to get as much information I can about the problem and then I surround myself, myself with people who have skills that I don't that are a part of solving that problem. And that's exactly what we've done with Opiate. What I look for is great need. You know, I have a sincere dislike for injustice. And I believe that part of the reason that we're in the boat that we're in now is because people put profit before people. You know, they put profit before people. They wanted to make money on the, for, on the lives and on the, the lives of our children. And uh, I have a big problem with that. So I quickly lose scope for how impossible people say something is. If I see injustice, you must act. All right, we're back with another episode of the Cold Star Project here at Live in Wilmington, North Carolina. I am here with David Reeser, founder of a couple of cool companies. And I wanted him on because he's great with the big idea and kind of challenging the world and getting out there and putting all the oomph you've got behind yourself, which uh, not everybody does. And some of us are wishy-washy, right? So we want to clean that up. Yeah, well, I am told by Tech Mountain, the company that uh, gives me these things, that I need to have this on at all times. So yeah, really okay, it's a secure really floor, floor, so yeah, we got to be really <laughs> careful what we let in. Yeah, um, I might have a bomb, you never know. <laughs> said the viewer. So David, thanks for agreeing to meet with me. I want to talk with you today about OPA, which is uh, a company that you founded. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what triggered that and what it is. Certainly. So uh, my business partner and I, Stan Martin, uh, we founded a different company about two years ago called, uh, two years ago called IT Works, and uh, that company is focused on providing cloud infrastructure for doctors, government, and attorneys. And uh, after founding that company and having some success in growing that company, uh, we knew very early in that part of our game plan was going to involve implementing artificial intelligence. Uh, to our cloud infrastructure. So we started attending a meetup that was happening locally, uh, specifically on artificial intelligence. And uh, we were really intrigued by some of the folks that were in the room. After a few months, there were, there were so many people coming out to this meetup group that we started asking questions like, instead of just coming here and learning about AI and learning what it can do, why don't we actually do something? And then not only, not only why, why don't should we do something, but why don't we do something that's going to improve our community, leveraging a technology that scares people. <laughs> Seriously. Right. Yeah. So I believe in AI right. for the good. Mm -hmm. AI for the good. You know, some folks are interested or, or worried that artificial intelligence is going to mean jobs. It's going to take away opportunities from, from human beings, and that's simply not the case. That's never going to happen. Uh, there will be circumstances where artificial intelligence will change the job market and it undoubtedly already has. But I believe in AI for the good because I believe technology can actually make us more human. Mm -hmm. I'm going to repeat that because yeah. I think that's really important. Technology can make us more human. And the reason I say that is it can take away a lot of the nasty jobs and the things that we're not so good at so we can focus on being together, mm -hmm. being in community with one another. Technology makes things better, faster, cheaper. And I believe if we leverage it in an appropriate fashion, it can work for our, our good and the good of society. And what had happened was the genesis of, of Opiate was we wanted to learn about AI um, and, and implement that into our, our cloud infrastructure business, IT Works Wilmington. And what had happened was in the process of, of looking at artificial intelligence and what we could solve, we looked at three big problems that we have in Wilmington. One, traffic, everybody can see traffic is a problem. And that's actually a pretty straightforward AI problem that we can solve, but it takes time and resources and it wasn't as sexy. So we wanted to tackle something that was really meaningful. And a couple other ideas came up, one of them being uh, opioid abuse. Now my background is actually in healthcare. You know, I spent 15 years in direct patient care and operating imaging centers and I was an MRI technologist, worked in x-ray, emergency rooms, operating rooms. I've, I've seen a lot of different things. And uh, opioid abuse is it's a real problem. And uh, when someone had brought up opioid abuse in the, with my medical background, knowing that we're tackling it with AI, we thought, wow, this is intriguing. Mm -hmm. So we took time to study the problem. You know, leveraging, if anyone out there is familiar with Stephen Blank, the lean startup, mm -hmm. the, that lean startup methodology, you know, we did a customer hypothesis, we studied the problem, we studied the folks that were involved, 
And after about five months, we discovered, wow, this is something we could really tackle. And AI could be a big, or a big piece of uh, solving this problem. That's how OPA got started. Super exciting. So, yes, AI may change the face of the job market, but like spreadsheets got rid of human calculators and, I don't know, word processors got rid of the typing pool, right? Sure. It's nothing really to be afraid of uh, unless you're unwilling to change, I guess. And yet, change is the constant of human nature. So, big problem. How did you get it into your head that you were going to stand up to this huge problem? <laughs> because it's intimidating, right? It's like, I'm going to do something about the opioid uh, problem that's killing thousands of people all the time, right? Sure. I mean, um, intimidating is probably not the word that I would use. Is it a big problem? Yes. I'm not intimidated, only because I have a sincere... Dis so it's, it's probably important for you to know some of my backstory. So I grew up in, in uh, some rough circumstances and if people would have seen me as a child and where I grew up, they, they probably didn't think I had much chance of going anywhere. And I've had teachers say the same, like, you know, wow. just keep doing what you're doing, you know, hanging out with the folks you are, that's pretty much going to be your story. So I very early on realized growing up, there's a difference between being poor and being broke, right? Poor is a state of mind. Broke is a temporary absence of having money in your pocket. And then, you know, we came from a poor situation, uh, but I was broke. I was always broke, and I realized it very early on, so I had a different mindset than some of my, my peers. So I, I never really believed in impossible. It's only impossible until somebody actually does it. And I've done plenty of things that people said was going to be impossible for me. So I don't approach things thinking that something is impossible or so outrageous. I just don't do that. What I do is I, I, I try to get as much information I can about the problem and then I surround myself with people who have skills that I don't that are a part of solving that problem. And that's exactly what we've done with Opiate. What I look for is great need. You know, I have a sincere dislike for injustice and I believe that part of the reason that we're in the boat that we're in now is because people put profit before people. You know, they put profit before people. They wanted to make money on the, for, on the lives and on the, the lives of our children. And uh, I have a big problem with that. So I quickly lose scope for how impossible people say something is. If I see injustice, you must act. If you see someone, Jason, a child standing on the highway, right. and it's 200 feet away, they're 200 feet away, and there's a tractor trailer coming, and they're only 25 feet from the kid, you may have a 1% chance of getting that kid out of the street, but are you gonna act, or are you just gonna watch them get hit by the, the vehicle? Right. Of course you're gonna not to. Of course you're gonna act. Yeah. Of course you're gonna act. And that's essentially what we've seen. You know, we're in a community where 11.6% of the populations are addicted to prescription opioid drugs. I did not know it was that much. That's 11.6%. That's, that's confirmed statistic. There's a bunch of people out there. <laughs> yeah. So for you folks who are struggling out there, I'm so sorry that that's happening. And it's not your fault. It's not your fault. You know, any, any person can get addicted to opioid drugs in five days. Physiologically, you can get addicted to opioid drugs in five days. So it doesn't, it's not a moral failing, it's not specific socioeconomical status that's, that's being affected, it's everyone. It's everyone. We started treating pain as a fifth vital sign, and when, when financial metrics were, were tied to how people felt after their hospital experience and they experienced pain and that was some, certainly a terrible thing, you know, reimbursement rates were affected. Now we started giving drugs to everybody so everyone was happy and look at the problem we created. But I'm less interested in talking about the problem, more interested in talking about solutions. Right. Yeah, let's That's move on to that. I mean, so you see this big problem. It's interesting what you just said about how you measure, <laughs> how the performance measures are put together. I hope people caught that. And uh, so you, you see some AI expertise, you go to some meetups. I've been to these meetups, they're awesome. Uh, and you realize, hey, there's some people here I could work with. What next? So we, uh, we took a look at the problem, as I said, if I'm, not, if I'm not being congruent with your question, let me know. But we took a look at the problem, we said, what part of our expertise um, applies to the challenge that we're looking at? And what we discovered very early on was that among our partners, and this is really important that you understand the definition of partners and what I call neighbors. So very early, early on what we discovered there are two major problems with, with fighting opioid abuse we're winning a lot of battles and we're losing the war 
the reason that's happening is there's not a lot of coordination, specifically of data um, and communications between our partners, and that's everyone in the fight against opioid abuse. So when I speak of rehab centers, hospitals, civic and faith-based groups, even family members, um, opiate, we're partners. We're working together to fight opioid abuse for our neighbors, and our neighbors are defined as anyone who's struggling with disease of opioid addiction, opioid use disorders, depending on who you're speaking to. But our neighbors are those who are struggling with addiction. Those are our neighbors. They're not addicts, they're our neighbors, because anyone can get addicted and we need to treat them better. So part of that is changing the way you speak of, about opioid addiction. They're our neighbors. So one part of the problem was the communication between the partners uh, to reduce the cost, the duplicity of effort, coordinate their efforts better so that, that together we can have a better outcome. And the other side of this um, is taking away the stigma around opioid abuse, so much stigma. So much stigma. If you actually look at the data, it, it just it just shows you there is absolutely no face to addiction. No face to addiction. There's no perfect archetype or, or manatar behind opioid abuse. It is everyone, everyone, anyone can be addicted. So we, we, we seek to solve the problem on the communication side by creating an integrated cloud platform um, that follows the same security and encryption protocols used by the NSA. And we're leveraging a lot of technology we developed in-house at IT Works to be able to deliver this platform of education powered by machine learning, which is a form of artificial intelligence, to quickly create prescriptive and predictive analytics, i.e. show our rehab center specifically how to work with our neighbors in such a way that they get better outcomes based on data so it's reproducible allow that, that communication to happen among everyone who's caring for our neighbor in a compliance driven fashion so they see the data they need to see and nothing more in order to protect the identity of our neighbors while at the same time leveraging the power of, of data to have better outcomes and reduce the cost. The other piece of it is the stigma. We want to take away the stigma by just changing the way we even talk about this you know, and, let, and let folks know it's not your fault and the data actually proves the fact that uh, it can happen to anyone and now let's just focus on solving the problem because opioid abuse is is no different a disease I mean it's different but it's it needs to be thought of the same way that we treat high blood pressure cholesterol diabetes it's a, it's a disease it's a physiologic response the other piece of it is is uh, developing uh, technology that can help us have a greater insight uh, into the recovery of our neighbors so what opiate really is at its core is a data science company mm -hmm with an extension of a wearable. So okay. we're actually in the process right now, maybe I'm skipping ahead, is it okay? Go, yeah. Jason, we're actually in the process right now, we just submitted for a National Institute of Health grant, um, specifically to study our, our biosensor array that we're gonna be utilizing. So OPA is gonna be looking at big data, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence on top of large data sets that have never touched each other before. I'm talking aggregation of all data surrounding opioid abuse. It's the mul largest multifaceted database when we're done. And it's already quickly growing to become that. So analyzing that data. And the other piece is, is this wearable technology. Just follow me for a moment here. Um, think of a wearable almost like a Fitbit that has the capacity to understand the entire life cycle of drugs in someone's bloodstream. So for our neighbors, this wearable will have the capacity to detect craving, detect overdose, and reverse it directly on the patient's body, on the patient, on our neighbor's body, without human intervention. Just by leveraging artificial intelligence and having this device biometrically tuned to the neighbor. Now we're confident we can do this, and it's going to take time, and it's going to take money, and a team. We have the team. We're getting the money and time is time. Nobody can force that, just take some time. So we're gonna be working with uh, UNCW's Human Performance Lab this summer actually to validate our sensor technology and then we'll be moving on to one of our partners that we've uh, joined forces with hopefully uh, late fall uh, to begin trials inside of uh, drug clinics. Wow, so getting it right out to the users. <laughs> There's so many things that have popped in my head from this because I read articles about this before coming here today 
uh, and, and learning about that, but I didn't realize that you were going to treat the problem when it happened, like they overdosed, right? So something's got to be in that wearable to inject, I guess, into the bloodstream. Naloxone will be in yeah. the wearable. Wow. So that's that's really neat. <laughs> yeah, we're we're really excited about it. I'm I'm not I'm not aloof in my understanding that it will be challenging to take this over the hill. And because I don't believe anything is impossible, I've also haven't accepted the self limiting belief that I won't get there. Hmm. And I've seen lots of things happen that were said to be impossible, and this is not my forced uh, rodeo in medical device. So I, I realize the hurdles with FDA and things that we're going to come across. But this is the other thing I'm confident enough is that when you have a big problem and you have the right people around you, you can solve just about anything if you have enough money and time. Just about anything. Hmm anything but the other piece is this like you have to have a sincere desire like the the why has to be so big that the what and how will, will come to mind your why has to be so big right. and we have a big why and we're all in one accord too so that the heart of opiate and we start with the heart of the business the heart of opiate is we want to save our neighbors right like we want to save our neighbors anything that doesn't help my neighbor is a no in my book I don't, my, I'm not motivated by money either. I'm people before profit in everything I do, truly. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't help my neighbor, it's an instant no. And if it does help my neighbor, it's when should we apply this or when should we do this? Maybe not now, but later. And so far with that understanding in seven months, we've done quite a bit. Lots of partnerships. We're being incubated by Google right now. So we're part of the Google startup ecosystem right now. Uh, we also secured some intellectual property and uh, have just a lot going for us. I'm really grateful and we have an amazing, amazing team of great people. Right. And, and I hope folks heard the message. <laughs> have a big why, right? Your why has got to be really gigantic, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It's the fuel for you. It's the, the I guess, not like the sun of truth that's in the core of you, right? The, all the goodness radiates out from. Well, well, the truth is, I mean, if your why is not big enough, the tough days, so I believe in mm -hmm. something, I take this personal, uh, person to person, and then I, 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 I ascribe it to business, is that we all have to have a hope uh, and a purpose. Everyone needs a hope and a purpose. Purpose is what, what, why do I get up in the morning and, and what am I driven to do? Like, what is the, the core of what I'm built for? What is my purpose? Like, what am I passionate about? What's that purpose? We have to have a, what we're going to do, you know, and the hope is what keeps you going when the chips are down, you know, and that it just seems like it's a drought all around you. You need a hope and you need a purpose. Yeah, you really do. And business is the same. You know, you have to have a you have to have a purpose. Why are, why are we doing opiate? We're doing opiate because I'm I'm tired of seeing my neighbors die. It's it's I'm not just gonna curse, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it clean. It's completely ridiculous, and I, I refuse to accept it. I see kids standing in the middle of the highway, and I can do something about it. I'm doing something about it. So that's my purpose. My hope is that that I sincerely believe that we're in a position that we can do something, and. Uh, I, I know it's so close. I know it's so close. So when I wake up in the morning some days when, when I see something new come out from the FDA and they're like, oh, we're not approving these and this is, this is going to be more challenging. I'm like, I just don't, I can't accept that because mm -hmm. I know where we're going and, and, and I feel like the, the, the folks that we have around us, we, we can pull this off. Right. Yeah, it's, not, it's not worth focusing on the negative. Yeah. Plus my kids give me hope too. It doesn't always have to come from work. You know, my family gives me hope. So when the chips are down and I'm having a bad day, I can go home and see my beautiful girls and, and that pumps me up and gets me whole again so that I can come back in the next day and deliver. Right. So we're not perfect. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. David, what have you learned about AI? There, there's a lot of like marketing crap out there about AI, right? Sure. It's not really AI. What they're talking about are complex nested if then statements, right? And so what have you learned about AI that, that has been useful for you and, and OPA? Wow, that's so much. Ooh, so well, probably, pick one, pick one yeah, case, then. not a problem. My, my data scientist, we have a, a chief data scientist we brought on board about four months ago. He would be better to answer this, but let me, let me take a stab at it. So what I think is the most powerful piece of AI for opiate, is that the nature of the questions? Yeah. So it would be the ability to look at massive amounts of data in such a way that we'd have to have 10 PhDs on board all looking at data at the same time 
and, and still it would take them 10 years to do what we can teach the computer can, our system to do in a day. Mm -hmm. So if, if the choice is hire 10 PhDs and feed them and have them be awake 24 seven for 10 years to try to figure out what we can do in a day, it becomes a pretty easy situation. But really the, the, the thing I enjoy most about having AI as part of Opiate is that we're going to come up with a finished pol polished product much faster and have it be validated because we're leveraging machine learning. You know, we teach it how to think and we can tell it to think any way we want and it can change unlike us as people. You know, we're very difficult to change, but I can change the algorithm by changing the equation, pulling in a couple new variables as we learn it dynamically and it learns also. Right. Are you focusing on then developing correlations or using visual representations of the data? Both, yeah. So, you know, we're pulling all the data together because clearly there are things that are correlated but not causative. Mm -hmm. um, and the, 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 a very simple question we're trying to answer is, of our neighbors, what are the, call, the highest correlating causative factors causing them to recover well mm -hmm. or not recover well, i.e. relapse? What are those? No one understands it. And the other key question that we're leveraging machine learning for, specifically doing um, uh, processing, processing signal, signal processing it's called, uh, with the wearable device, is to tease out these signals that, that identify craving, because no one biometrically understands craving. We know biometrically what overdose looks like. Like I'm totally confident what that looks like. No one understands unique craving, and we're gonna biometrically tune that uh, to the, each individual. So what AI does is it speeds up our learning, gets us a product to market faster, is a data-driven approach to tackling opioid abuse that is not subjective at all. It's completely objective, data-driven, math-driven, and uh, it will help us learn faster, refine models even faster, import new data into it, and have higher predictability on the back end. All right, so fascinating answer. And it highlights again, and it's something that you brought up earlier, there's all this data out there, and, and like five years ago or so, they were talking about a data lake and whatnot, and all that mm -hmm. has come together. But there is so much data that has not been fit together quite this way, right? And, and, and inspected and sifted through and checked, right? It's a, I think it's very tempting for us who are outside the, the tech profession uh, to think, oh, everything's already been taken care of, or somebody must be looking at that. And I, I, I'm seeing more and more that this just is not the case. Right, we had a, a great LexisNexis uh, data scientist, chief data scientist from there, That's right. do, a, do a lecture, and I'm going to be talking to him Wednesday. Mr. Uh, Shaw, yeah. Yeah, yeah Jesse Shaw. Oh, and uh, it, he's looking at um, graphic representations of fraud. And, and see, like it's a brand new way of looking at things, right? I had never run into that before. And you, you may have thought, oh, well, the insurance companies must have been doing this for years and years before. I, no, this is brand new cutting edge stuff. He's just figuring out. This is what fraud looks like, he says, as he shows an image of these blocks and dots on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by the end of the hour, I was getting a pretty good idea of how to see this stuff myself, right? Yeah, those visualizations are super powerful. Mm -hmm. Actually, at OPA, we're, I didn't answer this part of your question, uh, but we're actually leveraging a tool called Superset. Mm -hmm. So we can okay. graphically or visually represent any data set that you give us. Um, and we can show you our own findings visually because it's really powerful. You can learn one, more in one of these graphical representations of the data than you can reading 20 pages of it and not completely understanding what you're reading. So it is super powerful, but yeah, the data science piece is, is unreal. And you speak of the data lake, you speak of all these problems and surely someone's looking at it. Lots of people are looking at data behind opioid abuse. The challenge is they have a different why, a different why. So there are, there are companies out there I will leave, will leave unnamed, but they're looking at uh, data science and utilizing in a way that they can just predict who the neighbors are who are gonna get addicted, and they sell that to insurance companies just so they don't prescribe those opiates to them. But they do it for the, the sheer reason that it'll make it cheaper to take care of them, and not for any other reason. Hmm. No substitution therapy. Our why is we wanna save our neighbors, we wanna reduce costs, we wanna help people. This is not about profit, but don't get mistaken, we will make profit, right? But it's people first, like we're going to aid, it's OPA, not OP solve. <laughs> this is going to be a tool in the toolkit. Right, I love it. How can people get a hold of you, find out more about OPA? Oh, certainly. 
So if you're listening to this podcast, you can search us out at opa.tech. That's our website. Uh, also, you'll be seeing some social media uh, starting up here in the next 30 to 60 days. We really took our time putting that together because we didn't want to launch it too soon and confused because no one's ever attacked opioid abuse like this before. So we wanted to make sure we got our messaging right. You can also search us out on Google. We've had uh, several write-ups and some TV interviews in the past. Just search uh, opioid um, uh, on TechWire. Uh, we had a national, nationwide article come out. Uh, or we can check out our video for Kukalors from 2018. Um, we didn't win the, the challenge, but we certainly got great exposure at that event. And honestly, just shoot me an email. If you want to learn more or you want to be a part of what we're doing, it takes a whole community to solve this problem. At our monthly meetings, we have representatives from the DA's office. We have uh, congressmen that come, uh, representatives from every rehab center in the area that come to our monthly meetings. So if you're really intrigued and you want to be part of this solution, I, I'd welcome you to send me an email, david at opa.tech. That's david at opiaid.tech. And if you're interested in attending one of these monthly events or learning more about what's going on, just shoot me an email. I'm, I'm happy to speak with you and, and, and help you any way that I can. And I uh, just appreciate you guys listening. I hope something I said was either inspiring or helpful to your career and would love to work with you if you also have an interest in putting people for profit. All right, awesome. Thanks for doing this, David. My sincere pleasure. Thanks, Jason. Cool.